Our last speaker is Dr. Sarah Bowen. Uh, she's a research and evaluation consultant who is recognized, a recognized expert in the field of language barriers in health settings. Dr. Bowen was previously associate professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta and founding director of the research and evaluation unit at the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Much of her research has focused on access and quality of care for underserved populations and effective strategies for promoting action on issues of low awareness within the healthcare system. She is the author of several research syntheses on the impact of language barriers, as well as practical resources for managers and practitioners. So uh, prior to the conference, I had a, also a fascinating exchange with Dr. Bowen and very happy to that she accepted to present on access, quality, safety, equity, evidence of impact of language barriers in health and healthcare. So welcome, Dr. Bowen. Thank you. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Um, before I begin, I'd like to um, acknowledge that I'm speaking you to, to you today from the beautiful Annapolis Valley, the Mi'kmaqi, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this, um, this event has really been a wonderful opportunity to reflect on the wealth that comes from the diversity of languages and cultures um, that we have across the country. Uh, merci au uh, comité organisateur. Thank you to the organizing committee for allowing me to participate in this event. Bien être I very much like to be perfectly bilingual, but it is not the case. En anglais pour ça. And I'll have to uh, keep going in English. So what I, I, the purpose of my presentation today is really to summarize the current state of knowledge of the impact of language barriers on, on, uh, within healthcare. Um, I'm not going to uh, speak about specific rich, um, research projects. Um, we've had some excellent presentations already today on that. Um, because my work has really focused on analyzing and synthesizing the international research, limited to that that's in English, um, to um, pull out, like, in the Canadian context, what can we learn? What can we be confident on and what we know about language barriers? And this review I've done um, really looking at what I call all four minority language constituencies in Canada. So official language speakers in minority situations, speakers of so-called immigrant languages, speakers of indigenous languages, and um, users of, of sign and visual languages. And what um, is indicated by the research is that the impacts of language barriers tend to be similar across all of those constituencies. Now, the context, of course, is very different. What people, how people would like a response may be very different, but the barriers are the same. And um, picking up on um, the previous speaker, the culture is so important. And culture, not just in terms of ethnic culture, but we're looking at you know, the culture created by structural inequities, uh, the culture of socioeconomic status, all of these kinds of cultures really affect health as well. But where my focus has been is to identify where is the evidence on language access as an independent factor in terms of health and healthcare access. And um, I want to also acknowledge that I do wear a few different hats. I am a researcher focusing um, on synth um, syntheses, as I mentioned before, but also with a very um, 
practical knowledge to action focus. Um, and I have also been involved as a manager within the health system and in developing language access programs. So I've created, um, starting, I was only realized how long ago it had been a few weeks ago, um, more than 20 years ago, the first of these um, uh, summaries that I did, this one was for Health Canada. And I have done some since, some of them are um, publicly available. And also then moving into more of the question, well, given that we, we understand these are the impacts, what do we do about it? How do we get from here to there? So I'm not going to give you all of the references and the findings of particular studies. The, um, my last slide has a number of resources where all of these, um, not all of them, but many of the really good research studies that have taken place in the past have been used to lead to these uh, conclusions. Um, so, and then, so I'm going to summarize that briefly, and then I'd like to focus a little bit because what else do we talk about these days, but the impact as it, what are we learning that comes from the impact um, on language barriers in terms of COVID and access to COVID services. So there's compelling international evidence on the risks of language barriers on, on everything that's been studied, this has been found. And it's not just, you know, what we think of as the formal services, um, but um, initial access all the way through to end of life care. So in terms of initial access that, um, this was studied earlier, earlier, earliest, and in depth. And it's strong and consistent evidence from any country that you go to. Almost every health service, there's impaired access. And it's not just, okay, can I get to the doctor and communicate? It's ambient information. What you learn because you're listening to TV or it comes across, and oh, there's a poster. Um, so that, of course, is particularly important, for example, in times of pandemics or other emergency, because often what you need is happening through the ambient um, environment. Health promotion, things like childbirth education classes, prevention, cancer screening, whether you get the recommended care um, and I, I won't go into detail because the the uh, Dr. Ryder gave such a good summary of this, but the particular challenges related to um, some services like mental health. And what the evidence suggests is that the greatest impact are on, um, is on preventive and primary care and the uh, conditions where that, are, that require verbal assessment, right? So if I break my leg in a country where I don't speak the language and I'm taken to the ER, not so much a challenge as if I have a major mental health episode. So there's barriers to initial access, but then also there's barriers that happen within the health encounter. And I think we're often quite tuned into the fact that there might be differences in psychosocial care because of the quality of communication. But what the research also suggests is it really also affects technical care. And that is because if there's barriers to diagnosis, then what the recommended treatment may be different. And also if some of the best treatments might be really complicated, people tend to skip over that and do something that you may not have to explain so much. One of my, in my earlier life, I did a lot of work in reproductive health and you found this in terms of contraception. You'd rather put in an IUD or something that you didn't have to explain any of the details to. So it ended up having, we found in Winnipeg, having very different patterns of, of uh, treatment. And um, again, we've already heard about the specific challenges of mental health. In my experience, reproductive health is also an area that creates incredible difficulties with a language barrier. <clears throat> 
So then we get to the question of quality of care. Okay, so there's, there's differences in perhaps in access, but does that affect the quality of care that, that individuals might get if there's a language barrier? And it's important to recognize that in the, the patient safety literature, quality, the word quality refers to evidence that the care is appropriate. Then you go to the language barrier literature and it has a slightly different meaning. It says, is it equitable care? Is the person who doesn't speak the dominant language getting the same care that a fluent English or French speaker would get? So a slightly different meaning that we need to sort of be aware of as, as we think this through. Um, so of course, if there's challenges to patient assessment, there's probably gonna be differences in prescribed treatment. And this really does um, show up in chronic disease management. Some of the earliest work was done on um, um, asthma management, actually, where they used intubation as as an indicator of risk of death. <laughs> they were found some tremendous differences. Um, and this goes all the way through to um, pain symptom management and elder and end of life care. Now, with all of those barriers, I guess we could expect that there might be some challenges in getting informed consent. And also, if there may not be good systems to respond to a language barrier, and, and across Canada, often there is very, very poor systems of responding to that. For example, using um, ad hoc interpreters who could be pulled from anywhere, then there's also real issues around pri uh, patient privacy. So challenges to ethical standards of care as well. Um, patient satisfaction has been a long standing area of interest for uh, researchers, um, but it's not just about satisfaction. So more recent research has looked at, you know, the confidence that a patient might have in the provider or in the overall uh, service or the overall health system. I, I think we're, we're learning or reflecting more on that during the pandemic based on racial and ethnic um, uh, differences, but certainly related to language as well. And really, uh, understanding that it's it's understanding what's going on also leads to satisfaction. Um, it's also important to mention that there's a language barrier often leads to an important knowledge gap within the health organization because commonly uh, minority language speakers are not included in evaluation and quality activities. Um, more recently, there's been attention to um, uh, provider satisfaction, and I, I think I'm step sort of overlapping a bit with some of Andrew's points here as well. But the um, research has identified the number of impacts on the provider experience. Um, again, not just satisfaction, but their perception of the risks uh, um, that patients uh, face and their risks, the, their diagnostic confidence, they have malpractice concerns, and some of the most vocal groups that are really concerned about this appear to be um, students, medical nursing students who uh, often feel that even their learning is impacted by this. In spite of that awareness, however, um, generally there's not much evidence that there's the necessary action to, you know, for active offer or to arrange for interpreters. So there's a bit of a gap between the awareness and the action here. The US Joint Commission um, commented many years ago now that communication is a prerequisite to safe care and that poor communication is a leading root cause of sentinel events. So there certainly has been research done specifically on language barriers 
So looking at adverse events, definitely a higher risk of adverse events. Looking at medication safety, um, many, many um, studies looking at uh, particularly patient error. So you get discharged from the hospital or you take your prescription home from the physician. And so solid evidence on um, patient error because they don't understand the prescriptions. Um, I remember um, at one point um, I was heading up um, a multicultural health program where we had health uh, educators who did both direct education and also acted as interpreters with the health system. Um, and, you know, being given a prescription, um, it was based on a misunderstanding of the Spanish constipation, um, which in some countries means constipation and in other mean, means I've got nasal congestion. Just, but you'd need to know. And it was only when the, the patient um, went to the pharmacy and came back with a prescription for um, suppositories that they said, suppositories, I'm supposed to put these in my nose, I've got a sinus infection. So it, sometimes things come to light um, where you can really see where um, you could have some quite serious errors based on misunderstanding medication. Now, recently, there's been a number of studies that use large administrative databases to ask the question, yes, okay, so we have all these evidence, we have all these studies that show that there's evidence of um, impact on, on access, on quality of care, even on patient safety, but are people dying? And generally with the studies that have been done to date, there's really not um, evidence of increased risk and some even show reduced risk. So here's an example that, that I would give. So you have Mr. A and he speaks some French, some English, depending on where he's living, but not enough to understand how to take his anticoagulant medication. So what does the research tell us? Well, first of all, the research would suggest he's much more likely to have a stroke and end up in hospital. But if he has a stroke, he's no more likely to die in hospital than fluent official language speakers with similar demographic characteristics and, and disease characteristics. So you might be saying, well, why, like, what's the difference? Why would we find all these impacts on everything except the risk of dying? And I think the, the, the explanations can be lumped in three categories. There may actually be a reduced risk of dying, but let's look at what's going on here. So some of them are research related factors. Um, data quality, the selection of the language variable, because remember that what, we, what we're looking at is, is there a language barrier? And I'm not sure if there's any large administrative database that tracks whether the, there was a language concord interaction. Doesn't matter what language you speak, the issue is, is there a barrier between you and your providers, right? So you can find data that says, oh, this person identifies their first language as French versus English, but that doesn't tell you about whether the care was delivered in a concordant language. Um, and also sometimes it's difficult to control for confounding conditions, right? So for example, immigrants tend to be younger on the whole than people who are born in Canada. Then as we discussed before, um, some conditions are more sensitive to communication. So preventive care is more sensitive to communication. Mental health is more sensitive to communication. If I have a stroke, I may not be able to talk anyway. Most hospitals have very good stroke management protocols. So maybe it wouldn't show up as much because of the, the kind of things that we tend to measure at looking at mortality. 
But the other thing, and this really is mostly positive, is some, um, a number of research studies indicate that when there's a language barrier, providers may show more caution. So some studies are showing evidence of longer length of stay, uh, more lab imaging tests being ordered. So they're, they're, they're taking care, they realize, right? Going back to providers' awareness of, you know, the, the, their lack of diagnostic confidence. So at the individual level, that might be okay. It does, however, have um, some important uh, implications for health system efficiency, particularly at a time health systems are feeling tremendously strained. So um, what can we conclude language barriers um, are, what effect are language barriers having on service utilization patterns? Well, in many cases, there is delayed presentation for care. If people lack the confidence that um, in, that Andrew was referring to earlier in dealing with health situations in a second language, they may delay. Delay, unfortunately, sometimes leads to eventually use of more intensive services. So instead of going to your GP, maybe you end up in the ER. I've already mentioned that there's evidence that in some situations, providers show increased caution which leads to ad additional investigations and length of stay. And greater risk of misdiagnosis, which of course is also a risk when there's a language barrier. You have people doctor shopping because, well, that didn't work, I'll try somebody else. Multiple investigations for the same condition, treating complications because of the misdiagnosis or the mismedication. And um, issues related to what we would call poor patient adherence, but if you don't really understand what the, what the prescribed treatment is, can we really call it adherence? So this is a really old slide. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, can't, I, I don't even have the energy to think about it if I added all of the research that's been taken place since 2004. But I wanted, because I was working within the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, to map out the, the invisible cost to the health system of not addressing language barriers. So you can't see, I'm sure, all of the little superscripts there, but I tried to link and come up with a, you know, a flow chart that would was actually tied to the research literature, literature sort of indicating how language barriers and, and the long run could lead to um, increased cost to the health system. Now, um, so that's, that's like, I don't know, 40 year summary of the, the literature on language barriers. And so now we're in a time where, where we have something a bit new. So the question, um, think about it as I'm talking, but what, given that we, what we already know about the risks of language barriers, what would we predict during a, a pandemic, right? And then what are we finding? Well, as has been the case in other forms of language access research, most of the equity research around COVID does focus on race ethnicity. Like nobody could have missed this, right? That there's higher incidence of COVID in um, a racialized populations. There has, in my mind, as I'm reading the literature, though, been um, a bit of a positive change in that it, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that there's increasing appreciation of intersectionality, right? It's not just that you might be a racialized minority or that you're in a front-facing job because that's all you can get. Um, that language interacts with these other factors. And some of the, there's a couple of very interesting studies that, that actually do um, pull that out. But in spite of the limitations of this sort of common failure to, to disentangle these many different impacts on, on health and access, there's clear evidence 
that language barriers do impact COVID and COVID care as an independent risk factor. And several studies find that there's increased risk of positivity if there's a language barrier present, even if you can control for the racial, socioeconomic, all those other factors that are often mixed together. And it seems that language barriers may be, um, and certainly some people have concluded this, may exacerbate other factors that put people at risk for getting COVID in the first place, as well as access to testing back, um, vaccines, et cetera. So if the infrastructure for language access is not in place, an event like the current pandemic really could be the tipping point for a lot of individuals who were coping maybe okay, um, but also for the system. So um, what does the literature indicate so far? And I must say that I have, this is preliminary. And these superscripts are not in the reports that I've, I've listed at the end of it are freely available online. Uh, though if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share some of the preliminary uh, research that I've done, but I wanna say this is preliminary. So what I'm finding is that there's a number of things that are consistent with the existing literature for decades, right? So impaired access to public health messaging, that's the ambient information, information on preventive actions, testing and available services, okay? So that we knew that, but it's more complicated now. So the role of social media is and the, as an additional source of misinformation, right? So if you can't really get your information from Health Canada, your local public health office, and I have found this personally because I do English language tutoring with um, adult immigrants. And I spend a lot of time saying, don't listen to the messages you're getting on the Facebook post that was sent by your mother, right? So um, I found this, per and I thought, and then I go into the literature and sure enough, people who are doing studies on this much higher reliance on social media because of that, the, that barrier. And we know, we know how dangerous that is in a pandemic. Another challenge is because it's a, a, a novel disease with rapidly changing model um, knowledge and rapidly changing guidelines, it makes it even harder for people who are doing translation and developing programs to keep up because there's that lag. And a third factor is the isolation, and I think this has come up already today, from existing support services. Um, that could be community centers, it could be family, could be trained interpreters, um, has also presented a, a, a unique challenge. And again, consistent with the existing literature, that there's barriers to specialized services. So thinking about testing, for example, and to like ongoing medical care. But now in the time of COVID, um, there are some additional factors. Um, the complexities of virtual appointment processes, evidence from a number of studies that the uptake on virtual appointments is less if there's a language barrier. Again, restrictions on, on patient companions, family interpreters. Um, lack of or misinformation on testing. Um, also barriers to contact tracing. And you can see that, right? So also consistent with the existing literature, are barriers within the health encounter. So quality of care, right? Assessment. Um, so assessing for delirium, for example, one article was talking about, very, very difficult. And the additional factors again are the restrictions on people who could do that. Um, sometimes 
even when there has been a practice of using interpreters that's been um, um, compromised. Masking protocols, um, the greatest attention has been directed to um, deaf and hard of hearing communities because then, you know, the benefit that from seeing actually lip reading partly, but it's also been um, an additional challenge for um, people who are not fluent in the dominant language. And even within the system, um, that general information is usually unilingual. So, you know, what are the what are the patient visiting from rules for my mother who's in a long term care facility? The two um, sets of rules and guidelines are often only in one language. Um, but what about mortality? Well. This is still a developing pandemic and I'm, not everybody has finished doing their research yet. So far, not evidence of increased mortality. I mean, there would be because you're more likely to get sick in the first place, right? But once you're admitted to hospital and you're in intensive care, is there evidence of um, increased mortality? We'll have to wait and see, but so far, no. But that's consistent with what we found before about other conditions. So I've started to map out a bit of a, a flow chart here. So linguistic barriers are often embedded into larger structural factors, right? So people who have language barriers may actually be at greater risk for COVID in the first place. So that is true. But what is what are some of the, the independent factors? Well, less likelihood that people will take appropriate precautions because they haven't got that information. Lower rates of vaccination, some studies are coming out on that. And decreased testing, definitely a couple of good studies, one in, in Canada, one in the US, that looks at higher positivity but lower testing. If there's a language barrier, once you separate it out from the other risk factors. Impaired co um, contact tracing. So, and all of these lead to an increased risk of positivity, which then leads to um, a greater risk that you'll end up in hospital. But then some of these other issues around um, barriers to testing or contact tracing also, uh, you know, lead to more further transmission in the community and the larger society. So in conclusion, what are some of the outcomes that, that are emerging from the research now when it comes to COVID? Lower testing rates, higher incidence of positivity, even when controlling for racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic characteristics, lower participation in telehealth visits, lower vaccine uptake, and multiple impacts on quality of care. Now, I'd just like to, th this is not the, the topic of my, uh, of my presentation today, but I would like to mention something I think is really important is like, what is the evidence on appropriate responses to addressing language barriers? And there are two main ways we can respond. The first is that we increase the proportion of language congruent encounters, okay? So where the providers and the patient are speaking the same language. The second is that we provide interpreter services. Now, within each of those groups, oops, went too far. Um, if we increase the proportion of language congruent encounters, the best is to have a, a bilingual provider or to refer somebody to a unilingual provider where there's a match. That is the best if it's feasible. Unfortunately, we know that's not feasible for all languages in all parts of the country. Um, we've already had some examples today of providing like language training for providers. And there's also the initiative of providing language training for patients. Of course, this is wonderful. This is gonna help. But if we look at the investment and the time it's gonna take to get to that point, it's not a complete response. 
So the second approach is to provide interpreter services. So trained confidential interpreters, which are not readily available across the country, I will mention that, are an excellent second choice. But what isn't a good choice is using ad hoc interpreters. You know, whether that's your, your daughter who came with you, whether it's somebody walking through the hospital at the time you get admitted, right? Whether it's a staff, another, it's a staff person in the hospital. There, there's been some very interesting research done about the risks um, by doing transcript analysis and looking at the number of miss interpretations and many of which are clinically significant if you use ad hoc interpreters. So that is really risky. And if I'd done this presentation five years ago and talked about a translation apps, I would have said no big X, but they are progressing. And I think we're realizing more and more that it can be a stopgap as long as we don't think it's the be all and end all. Uh, I'm sure many of you have plugged something into Google Translate and found out what weird and wonderful um, results you get. It can be really dangerous. But in, if you're looking at more routine things um, around care, there, there, there is a role. We just have to be very careful about it. Now, um, before I wrap up, I'd just like to... Um, because I'm a very practical person, I'd like to say, well, so what? Like we have to get to the so what? Um, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? So some takeaway points. So people who are in a position to make funding decisions, to provide leadership to the health system, here's some of the takeaways I'd, I'd like, I, I, hope, I hope you take away. Um, the first thing is to remember that hidden costs still cost. I've often talked to um, healthcare and they say, well, no, 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 it's, it's important to provide language access, but oh, I mean, it would cost way too much money. Well, you know what? You're paying for it now, but it's a hidden cost. You're not, when, when that extra test goes through the lab, right? It doesn't come across as oh, a cost of a language barrier, right? When people have, four or five different assessments because the first one was wrong, that doesn't come across. So the, the costs are there, we just, just doesn't have a separate budget line. And the other thing is for too long, we have treated language access as sort of, what's well, a nice thing to do if we have any resources left over. Uh-uh. Providing language access is an important mechanism for risk management. It's not an add-on either. It's a, a way that we can address problems we already have. So when I was working at the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, one of the strategies that we used was to integrate the, the education around um, language barriers into what was a big thing at the time in the organization, their integrated risk management framework. So go to the literature. So what I found was that 43 out of 154 high level risks were affected by language barriers. And when you looked at patient safety risks, 26 of the 31 patient safety risks were affected by language barriers. So it's not, it's not a nice thing to do. It's a necessary thing to do. The other thing um, um, I take away that, that, that I'd like to leave you with is that we need policy. Um, in a lot of health organizations, you know, sometimes people will do active offers, sometimes they'll call an interpreter, or sometimes they won't. There needs to be really clear policy that's based on, on standards. And COVID has taught us one thing is that technology can help. Like here we are having this conference <laughs> and I did not have to fly to Montreal. Um, so the, 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 the potential of technology to link people um, with providers who speak their language, right? There's, there's way, more way more potential 
to address language barriers with technology. And I'm not talking about a Google Translate technology. I'm talking about platforms like this. And the final thought I would, I would leave you with is that if you plan, plan for all four language constituencies. In many places, you know, like um, indigenous service organizations maybe have great initiatives to provide access to uh, people who speak indigenous languages. There may be settlement agencies or language banks that deal with immigrant languages, you know, the we need to have a coordinated response. And that's hard because often there's different advocates, different, there's different rights under the law, there's different government departments and there's different advocates, but we need to look at the evidence and the evidence says the impacts are very similar. So we need to come up with a strategy that is appropriate for all of those constituencies, but doesn't say, oh, well, we're just gonna deal with one. And some, maybe some takeaways for providers. I think it's really recognizing the key role they have, you know, at the sharp end of, of arranging for referral for interpretation, doing after active offer. And the importance of selecting appropriate interpretation if interpretation is needed. And also, you know, being aware of some of the common misconceptions, because often we think, oh, well, you know, um, and I think Andrew gave some examples of this as well, that so-and-so, you know, they could get by, you know, we can have a normal conversation when, you know, we had a good conversation about weather and where they work. Um, it's been observed that sometimes it is riskier if somebody speaks some English or French than if they don't speak anything at all, because if there's no communication, you know, there's a problem. But if there's some communication, you don't know if really what's being communicated is accurate or not. Um, and not just to focus on language access in an emergency situation where, where the providers may be feeling the pressure. And not to think that, oh, I can easily assess. Oh, I think I'm repeating some more of Andrew's words here, um, whether their, their language is appropriate in this situation. And a bit of a warning too about a uh, false fluency. And that is particularly for languages that are, are related of, of, with a lot of words. Um, I have a bit of French, I have a bit of Spanish. And I tell you, like you learn the words that you cannot say and just, just avoid that in other languages means, you know, I'm not gonna say, I don't translate, I'm excited into Spanish. Because then I'm going to say I'm excitada, and that is not something you want to hear from me when I'm doing a presentation. So false fluency is um, is a real risk when you know a bit of the language. And this is so important that even people who are completely bilingual if they're under stress, if they're in pain, they may not be able to do it, not in their second language. And there's an emerging literature about the effects of, on second language uh, retention and the aging process. And so this, I mean, this emerged in Manitoba 25 years ago, and we heard it from the frontline staff. They were saying, well, Mrs. So-and-so came in here and she, you know, she, old Ukrainian lady, she could speak English quite well, and now she can't anymore. So it's not like we can re reach a point and then it's done. And for researchers, a few last words there. Um, it's absolutely critical that we understand the key concepts. And I mentioned earlier that the, what we wanna measure in doing this is, is it a language congruent or non-congruent interaction? We need to be aware of the limitations of the databases that we're working with. Um, to, be, to be alert to the interrelationship of language barriers to other potential risk factors. And that's a challenge, but we need to be able to separate this out um, more clearly than most studies are doing now and to be really aware of the data limitations.
the um, oh, and I think this has been mentioned a couple of times already, but I'm going to say it again to make sure that the research team includes a range of, sk of skills and knowledge, including like the patient community input. We want to be able to triangul triangulate methods. So if I find, a, you know, the crunch the numbers, yeah, but does that resonate? Does that actually fit the experience of, of people who've, who've, who've lived it? And if it doesn't, go back to your numbers. And I think we're becoming much more aware of the importance of, well, just the, the terrible impact of exclusion. I think COVID has helped with that. And so we need to pay much more attention to designing research and evaluation activities that ensure inclusion and ensure inclusion of non-dominant language speakers. So, I'm glad that language access seems to be emerging uh, more as an equity issue, because when I started this work, it really was seen as an issue of cultural sensitivity, cultural competence, and I'm not dumping on cultural <laughs> sensitivity, um, but um, as Andrew mentioned, like it's, it's, there's culture and there's language and the inter Racked and you, you, you can't just wrap it up in one big ball. And I think to win recognize that failing to provide adequate language access is an element of structural discrimination uh, because language barriers are directly related to issues of access, quality, safety, risk management. So I, I do have um, these, and I'm, I'm sure the list of direct, the, the, the uh, internet list um, links to a number of reports that um, some of the conclusions that I presented today are, are based on. Um, I, I would encourage you to look at the wonderful primary research that people other than me have been doing. Uh, merci. J'espère que cette présentation servira à nourrir votre dialogue. Thank you for your attention. I hope that, it's, that it contributes to your dialogue, and I'm available for questions. Thank you so much. This was a very informative presentation, and it uh, catered to the different groups that are on in this conference. So this is the message is is really tailored to to those groups. So thank you for doing this. Um, I thought I would call on uh, Dr. Juan Carlos, I hope I'm saying it right, Sher Sherwin, to uh, maybe talk to us about the comment he put in because it really exemplifies or it, it does give a good example of some of the complexity and, and kind of the circle that some patients that are non-English or non-French speaking uh, might face in, in uh, a health healthcare crisis. So, um, can you talk to us about your comment, please? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Bowen, for making that excellent presentation and your final points, which I totally agree with. Uh, I'm a family doctor that works in a community health uh, center or a CLSC as they're known here in Montreal. Uh, we happen to be in Park Extension where uh, the main non-English, non-French language that is spoken is uh, Punjabi, uh, one of the northern Indian languages of India. Um, we are lucky in our CLSC uh, system to have uh, interpreters uh, paid for, uh, and this was for many years back and continues to be so. I hope it'll continue also. Uh, I wrote in, in the chat uh, basically a scenario where a language barrier uh, has an impact on people who don't speak English or French well enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just started the, the scenario as someone uh, needs to get uh, urgent uh, medical care. So usually they would be directed to calling 811. Um, that requires French and English. So then that means that they need to have a family, uh, a relative or a, a friend. Uh, and sometimes the friend might requ request uh, a payment uh, for the fee of being the interpreter. So then uh, they would call, let's say, 811, and uh, the interpreter would uh, tell them, okay, so now you have to call a walk-in clinic. Uh, 
that requires internet literacy. So uh, again, the interpreter or the friend or whoever has to help the, uh, the patient navigate that system, uh, find the walk-in clinic, uh, again, make a phone call uh, to find out if there is a spot that day in the walk-in clinic to be seen. Um, finally, that is secured. Uh, and then they have to get themselves to that clinic, which then requires public transportation or a taxi or a car or whatever means. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then unfortunately what we see as uh, healthcare providers is then patients have to have no resort but to go to an emergency room. Mm -hmm. And we know that that is not good, especially during COVID where we want to minimize exposure. Uh, and there are issues as you described uh, of then most hospitals in Montreal have no formal system of uh, interpretation. Um, so they're all requiring uh, ad hoc interpretation uh, where uh, they make a, a call uh, across the hospital uh, intercom system. Please, uh, we need a Mandarin interpreter for the emergency room. Uh, and that's the kind of quality of care that we will find maybe not just in Montreal, but many hospitals in cities across Canada. Uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's a situation that can be dealt with in the emergency room, but then um, again, there the interpreter is needed. After the, the, the encounter in the emergency room, they are discharged and they still need uh, information in terms of how to get the medications, how to go to a pharmacy, how to uh, uh, properly use the pharmacy as, as uh, was given in an example. Uh, and so then the cycle never stops. Uh, then they will ask themselves, okay, I went to the emergency room, but I still need a nurse or a doctor to see if I'm okay. And so then we start again, the whole cycle all over again, call 811 and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's something that I see almost every day. And like you said, unless we survey uh, the patients, uh, the people who are using the health and social service system, we will never know uh, how bad a job we're doing because we never ask their opinion on how things are out there in the real world. Well, we can't because we're not communicating with them. You know, it, I find it just so, I mean, one of the most upsetting things, the example that you gave so clearly is that that's the pattern. It's not just, oh, this is the Punjabi population in Montreal. That's the standard across Canada. And right now it's, it's much worse because those informal supports are often cut out of the, the mix, right? Because of all the restrictions on visitors and things like that in many provinces. Um, you gave a really good, uh, paint a really clear picture too of like how, what the impacts are on providers when you're trying to, you're, you're trying to do the best you can for your, patient and the system is not supporting you doing that. Thank you so much for this example and your comments on this. Um, we've had a lot of comments I, and we're running out of time. I'm just gonna conclude for today, uh, but most of the comments are really enjoyed the day. Can't wait for tomorrow's conference so that we take it with the very positive vibes. Thank you, uh, a lot of thank yous for your talk, um, very relevant. And so I'm gonna conclude uh, that I think today was really a testament of how we have a very active cadre of diverse stakeholders. And we saw that diversity today and we're all engaged in documenting best practices and best evidence that in this field that is becoming so important. Even, I don't know if you can see, but even my cat agrees. So for, for a first day, I think uh, all speakers really exceeded our expectations. So we're really thankful to all of you, thankful to all the participants. We had a real great turn, turnout. And so we're pleased with that. And we look forward to tomorrow's presentations. And we wish you all a very pleasant afternoon and a nice uh, evening. So vous souhaitez un bel après-midi. So we wish you a nice afternoon and a wonderful evening. Thank you again tomorrow. Bye.